Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of After Hours with Team Taser. I am your host, Richter Riolo, and I am joined by my sassy, glassy partner, Tammy Murray, and our new co-host, Team Taser's investigator reporter, Steve Alcorn. Sadly, Nadia Moore is on an indefinite vacation, but we hope to have her back here with us someday. Tonight, our esteemed guest is Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum. He's conducted a ton of laboratory research and fieldwork throughout the Pacific Northwest, as well as in Canada, China, and Russia. The Russia story is kind of funny, actually, but you'll have to get to that in the second part of the interview. Anyways, he has spoken about his findings in numerous interviews, including NPR's Science Friday and Radio West, television appearances, including The Today Show, National Geographic, Discovery, History, Sci-Fi, Animal Planet, and now After Hours with Team Taser. He has given many public and professional presentations and was a featured scientist in Scientific American and the National AAAS webpage. Whatever that is. I don't know. Hey, I'm just an artist. Anyways, perhaps you've seen him on television on History Channel's Monster Quest series or his fantastic documentary that was on the Discovery Channel, Sasquatch, where legend meets science, which is also a book in its second printing. Um, you know, I gotta say, he has been our voice of reason in the Bigfoot community, which has been recently muddied with hoaxers and extortionists. So, Dr. Meldrum, being a professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University, makes him a heavy hitter. And he is here today, talking about his Sasquatch field guide, which has just been printed, uh, the Falcon Project, which is an unmanned blimp that's looking for Sasquatch quietly in the woods from the air, and his thoughts and opinions are shared on Dr. Ketchum proving that Wookiees are real and that the Yeti debacle he was awkwardly a part of where he was publicly stated he felt the conference was orchestrated with publicity stunts to promote tourism in Russia, but... Yeah, that's towards the end. But anyways, let's get on with part one of our interview with our esteemed guest, Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum. Hello. Hello, Dr. Meldrum. Yes. This is Richter Riolo, your favorite artist. Great. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you for doing this. I have uh, Tammy and Steve Elkhorn joining us shortly. Okay. okay, so Tammy just popped in. Tammy is now. Say hello to the doctor, Tammy. Hi, Dr. Meldrum. Hi, Tammy. How are you? I'm doing fine, thanks. I'm forward to this. <laughs> Good. We also have Steve Elkhorn. Say hi, Steve. Hey, hey Dr. Meldrum. How are you doing? Very good, thanks. Well, thank you for taking the time to do this little interview. We are so excited to have you on to talk about your new field guide that you've just recently published, mm -hmm. and also the Falcon um, Project as well, yeah. and all the recent rumblings that's been going on in the Bigfoot community. I got to say, though, I think as a Bigfoot enthusiast and commentator, it, this has been the craziest past yeah. six months in Bigfooting. It, it has, and, yeah. and, and there's been an unfortunate uh, level of distraction, I think, more than anything. So, mm -hmm. it. Um, I hope we we clear. I hope we clear out of this uh, fog and some confusion here real quickly, and are able to move on, move on to uh, bigger and better things. Well, unfortunately, as you know, with human nature, there's going to be all different kinds of things happening. We have Wookiees now in the mix, and being a huge yeah. Star Wars fan that I am, I can't be more excited because out of anything that the Dr. Ketchum Circus has proven is that Star Wars is real. <laughs> <laughs> so, in all, in all seriousness... Quite an odd development. Yeah. You know, thank God for ketchup. Oh my God, ketchup at Star Wars. I mean, who cares about Bigfoot? Star Wars is real. All right, all right. Let's get serious now. Let's talk about your um, Bigfoot field guide. Um, what was your motivation for uh, creating this? Did you want to create like an updated field guide? Because I know there was that one that came out years ago from someone else. Well, there was one. Yes, there was one that was published through the International Society of Cryptozoology back in the days of Richard Greenwell, and it was a little a little pamphlet, and it had some, some good information. It wasn't really visual, um, 
uh, you know, not, not intended really to be something that was taken out of the field. I was actually approached by a company that produces this kind of heavily laminated, you know, waterproof field guides that are, that are intended to be taken out in the elements. And, and uh, uh, they have quite a, quite a broad listing. I mean, they started off with marine guides and, and went to all different types of natural history guides. And, and uh, the publisher there, Jim Morehouse, uh, uh, approached me about the, of what I thought about the prospects of, uh, of a field guide for Sasquatch. They had, they had sort of floated the idea with some of their clients and, and had gotten a very, not surprisingly, a very positive, very enthusiastic response. And, you know, the more I thought about it, I thought that there certainly was a need, there was a niche. Because one of the things that I'm often bemoaning is the fact that, um, that so much of the enthusiasm of, of, um, of Bigfoot investigators gets sort of misdirected, gets uh, you know, well-intentioned, but, but not uh, very thoughtfully applied to the collection and preservation and discrimination of data. And so I thought, hey, here's a, here's a chance to, uh, to put something together on a small scale. I mean, obviously, it's, <coughs> it's intended. <coughs> Pardon me. It's still getting over this cold. It's intended to be uh, portable, and so it's uh, it's on a small format, about the size of a road map that folds out to about six six panels, six double-sided panels. And so they're little little vignettes that address the different types of evidence that might be encountered in the field, and and and, and also uh, field marks that would be used to identify. You know, I was always inspired by Dr. Bindernagel's uh, uh, aspirations that that field guide depict Sasquatch. Um, and his, uh, his figure that he, he features so prominently in the book, which we kind of borrowed the spirit of, contrasting the, the silhouette or the outline of a, of a Sasquatch with a bear, we added a little hiker with his uh, you know, cap and rucksack on there uh, as well. Uh, and, and you know, what are the distinguishing features? How would you how would you determine whether that flash of fur that you saw in the trees was really a Sasquatch and not a bear or a moose or an elk? Right. So it was fun. I had a good time putting it together. And, uh, Jim was uh, really very thoughtful and, and very proactive in making suggestions and, and uh, contributing ideas about what would be uh, good material. You know, we tried to kind of bring the focus, not let the focus get too broad, but keep it related directly to the collection of, of field data and the discrimination of field data with a little bit of background information about that. So I, I really think it'll be popular and it'll be a fun and interesting tool. Well, you know, like I, like I said, if, if, uh, you know, if, if the search for Sasquatch gets people out in the woods and gets them uh, interested and uh, in, uh, inquiring about uh, various aspects of natural history, that's great. I mean, I think well, I wanted to say that I was talking with Tammy a few months ago. We had a contest in Team Taser. It was a beard contest. And um, one of the grand prizes was your uh, Sasquatch or Legend Meets Science book. Oh, uh -huh. And also there are other books that Lupe Mendoza and myself uh, purchased to give to everybody that participated in the contest. So they all got something. And one of the books Good. was uh, the older field guide. And I remember looking at it with Tammy and thinking, Gosh, wouldn't it be great to have a new one that was made? And it's almost as if you connected with that cosmic vibe and now came out with this. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and the hope is, we, I've made in some discussions with our publisher for Sasquatch Religion Meets Science uh, because I've been kind of torn. I mean, we're to the point, we, we ran to the end of, of the last printing, so there's about 13,000. Well, not now. They actually went ahead without uh, my knowledge and, and did an additional print. So there's about there's now about fifteen thousand copies in print. But I, I had hoped that at the end of that last printing, before you know, like catch them before they went ahead and did another printing, that we could discuss the possibility of doing a a revised, expanded second edition. And because you know, ten years, almost ten years, mm -hmm. has gone by. Well, not quite six, six seven years has gone by. Uh, but, but a lot has happened in those six or seven years, and uh, I, I thought that it would be it would be uh, you know, very useful, 
beneficial to kind of follow those threads along uh, in each of those chapters and add, you know, one or two elements that have... Uh, well, in a way, aren't, aren't you kind of glad that you didn't? Because can you, with everything that's happened now in light of the Ketchum Circus, we now know, we now have answers as to what's come out, what her report is, how it was published, and um, there was no peer review, things like that. So if you had expanded on your uh, Sasquatch religion meets science, you could have easily had alluded to, oh, there's an ongoing DNA study by Dr. Ketchum, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then could you imagine yeah. your yeah. face palm follow-up? Oh, gosh, publishers, oh, we have to make a third publishing now. We need to make an addendum. Oh, my God. You know, okay, so back on to your... Um, yeah, that could have been an unfortunate situation. Oh. Here, uh, so I, I have to say that I've had my reservation from the get-go uh, concerning that project. And, oh. uh, okay, now it's gone even... from Wookiees to giant lemurs. All right, so anyways, back on your little pamphlet. Um, our yeah. friend, our friend, the Reverend Jeff, uh, asks... With regards to the new Bigfoot Field Guide you just released, what is the basic information and what type of researcher is it created for? Well, I think it'll, it'll have uh, elements that will appeal to uh, all levels of, of experience, uh, both the, the quote-unquote newbie as well as, as uh, individuals who've been out there uh, for a long time. I mean, they're there are, are very fundamental issues uh, and, and, and very, some very technical issues of, of discriminating uh, morphology uh, of the foot as it relates to and is expressed in the footprint of, uh, of bears versus, uh, versus, versus Sasquatch. I mean, I get, I mean, I'm, I'm often impressed by the, the, the level of awareness of, of a lot of uh, enthusiasts. Who chime in on a Facebook page. I mean, that's one of the things that I've tried to do with my Facebook page is also use that as a platform to try to educate by like throwing up examples. Now, what do you think about this? Sometimes people misinterpret it. They think that I'm asking because I don't know. And I'm asking, no, I'm not. I'm asking, in some instances, that may be the case that there's some real odd thing and I'm saying, hey, this is, I'm scratching my head, what does this mean? But in most cases, I'm throwing it up to get responses from from the, uh, the followers, from the friends, and see if they are aware of, of how one would go about discriminating these kinds of things and eliminating the common wildlife. And, uh, you know, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm repeatedly impressed because a lot of people are uh, well informed, but there's a lot of people out there. I mean, if you were, you know, had any idea of the volume of the stream of, of submissions, if you will, that I receive on a daily basis, oftentimes, of footprints and photographs and this and that. Uh, the, uh, the the lack of, of familiarity with wildlife time amongst the average Bigfoot enthusiast group is uh, is you know sometimes a bit appalling. <laughs> I, you know, I, I keep telling people in this day and age, with the tremendous resources that are available on the internet, you know, everybody that's doing this should be an expert in in uh, track analysis at least those those most commonly misidentified large mammals like bears right I should know barefoot inside and out uh, because i get re repeatedly get uh, examples of bare footprints that are sent um, as possible examples of sasquatch track well david matt dorf uh had a few questions and tammy's got mm -hmm. them as well. So let's uh, move this on to the other questions from David here. Okay. Tammy? Okay, Dr. Meldrum, the question is, you spoke of the flood of uh, information or um, uh, I'm having trouble stuttering here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the question okay. is, let's just get right to the question. How many Bigfoot related emails and a uh, stream of and volume of information do you get a week and how many do you immediately dismiss? Well, <clears throat> um, I guess if you take some of the email traffic has been replaced by uh, Facebook messaging, but I mean on a daily basis, I haven't even thought about it on a weekly basis. I mean I get literally dozens on a daily basis. I, I usually come in in the morning and, you know, I have to sit through and I have my regular business, university business, 
occupies my attention. But there's there's always a good dozen or so um, submissions from uh, from various people. Uh, the, I have to say, unfortunately, that the majority of stuff that gets posted or that gets emailed to me uh, can be immediately dismissed. There are, uh, you know, there's just a propensity of people to get excited about, I don't necessarily like the term, but kind of description, uh, blob squatches. I, I'm just dismayed sometimes by the, by the uh, uh, some individuals who see a, a Sasquatch in every shadow looking, in every shadow, in every nook and cranny, uh, and even high up in the tops of the trees. There was one, there was one uh, bevy of of uh, photographs that were posted here just within the last several days, and and uh, every shadow in up in this pine tree was a Sasquatch. I mean, there were half a dozen Sasquatches in one tree. Well, don't forget, you there's know, also I, beavers I, too. I have to ask myself, if, you know, is this person uh, sincere, or are they just uh, just trying to jerk someone's chain and, and uh, make well, a mockery of it? Well, but, do you also recall when the the porcupine? Remember when that porcupine was in the tree? And oh, that's a squatch. Uh, there's remember that time there was that photo of a blob squash, and it was actually a porcupine that was up in a tree. Oh, that's a Bigfoot yeah, baby, and it's just like, oh that. gosh, that would be a common one. I mean, it's the funniest thing. I, I was at a conference one time and got pulled aside by a woman who was all excited about her pictures, and she she starts laying out these pictures uh, on the tabletop, and uh, you know there was this funny looking little shape that could have been a a Sasquatch, but it was only six inches tall. It was down underneath a, a, a bush in her garden. <laughs> and I said, you, you realize the size? She said, oh, yeah, they come a very small size. <laughs> and then there was another one. A woman had this quite uh, intriguing photograph that looked like a face within the foliage of a tree. And I said that it was very cropped in and enlarged. And I said, well, you, you don't happen to have the original photo, do you? She said, oh, yeah, she pulled out the original photo. Well, the photo was taken through a window in her stairwell looking out into a tree that was right against the house. And so this face was just literally floating there in the tree, probably about 15 feet off the ground because it was up about second story. And, um, and, and she was able to, uh, uh, she was able to uh, uh, see this image there within that, uh, within that picture. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, fun. Well, it seems like... Yeah, I hate to interrupt, but you know what? I, I totally spaced on something when I scheduled this, and I have a, a student at the door. Can mm -hmm. this, this, we're, we're recording this? Yeah, but we can, we, can, we can come right back whenever you feel like it. You're able to. So Okay. Well, well, just give me uh, three minutes, and I'll yeah. be right back. Okay. I'm sorry. That's fine. That's fine. Well, totally understand. All righty. So our next question now, we are now recording once again. Tammy, you have one more question? Yeah, uh, the question is, Dr. Meldrum, how do you balance your job and your work and being a Bigfoot celebrity and all the obligations involved in that, and it, does it allow you to continue to spend the time in the field that you like to do? Well, I, uh, when I stay focused on, on editorship uh, responsibility, I think those are important contributions that, to the scientific community to my colleagues to uh, continue to bring this subject to the fore and and to involve their their dialogue in you know in this ongoing investigation so um, you know I, I try to be very careful that when I'm uh, you know when I'm doing appearances or when I'm doing um, speaking engagements that those are on weekends on my own time for the most part <laughs> and um, and and so far, no. There's, I mean, there's. It would be great to have a, an extra ten hours in every day, but uh, but it would just fill up uh, anyway. Um, it's uh, it's always a balancing act, and and I don't always get everything done that I would like to get done. But uh, but you know, mine is not a nine to five job. I mean, I'm always reading things at home or correcting papers at home or. Or, or whatnot, and uh, I do have the luxury, though, of having some extra free time in the summertime when we're between semesters. I often have to teach a, a summer course. We have some offerings during our summer session, but that usually only takes a four-week block, and then I have 
you know, two, two and a half months that I can devote to, uh, to other things, including field work. So that thankfully that, you know, really correlates with the, the weather, especially here in the Intermountain West, um, so that we can uh, get out and do the things we want to do in the summer months. Always uh, trying to meet a deadline or prepare for for a commitment and, and uh, I'm still stand top of all the other responsibilities I have. So you're going to be meeting up with Rob Godet in the next month or two, right? With, with whom? Rob Godet. He's a Bigfoot chick. Uh, Squatch Unlimited, Louisiana. Do you know what I'm talking about? Nope. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Well, then we'll move on from that. Uh, <laughs> the, the Falcon Project. Uh, let's talk about the Falcon Project. This high-quality blimp that's going to be uh, hopefully making a big change in big footing. What's going on with that? Well, um, the uh, the initial fundraising effort uh, got off to a <laughs> disappointing non-start. Uh, I, I was actually kind of surprised by the the reaction. As were a number of people. We we had some uh, assistance from a professional marketer, and he thought this was a slam dunk. Uh, proposition and uh, was dismayed by the lukewarm or, or uh, uh, you know, ambivalent reception. But there's a, an important development has occurred that we're pursuing and this, this is a, an individual uh, came forward and he has uh, done work with uh, uh, unmanned aerial aircraft and in fact has several. And uh, he's done contract work with, uh, you know, for documentaries. He's done contract work looking for Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan uh, and so forth, using these un uh, various types of unmanned drones. And he has one that, uh, with a command center already equipped and, and you know, with a nice portable trailer that uh, uh, he's interested in uh, making a donation to the university. To, uh, he's, he's done with it, and basically it's just in storage. And he would just he would rather <clears throat> have uh, us utilize it, and uh, and of course he, he garner uh, a tax write off and do the donation. But it, we may be in a position here within the next couple of months to to have about a half a million dollars worth of equipment uh, in our pocket, and so then it would just be a matter of. of uh, cobbling together the corporate sponsorships and individual philanthropists who are kind of in the wings and seeing how this develops. Is it pretty quiet? Yes. It's a similar type of, a, of an apparatus. It's not the catamaran style, okay. uh, that, that particular unique design or interesting design that provides a very stable platform. But it, uh, it's about a 50-foot uh, helium-filled surge of that will um, uh, that will accommodate uh, uh, the sufficient payload to allow us to use the high-end thermal imaging and videography equipment that we had intended to. And um, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's it's great. I mean, it's, <laughs> it it you know you don't look a gift horse in the mouth if if this is. Uh, it, it, it has functioned. It, it's, it's tried and true. It's not uh, a prototype. You know, it's a it's a well um, well established design that has, has been used in, in many different uh, circumstances. It has most of the same capabilities as, as the catamaran style balloons would have. So it's um, the Falcon project is very much alive. And I, you know, as you pointed out, I, I really think this will be a new step. I mean, I think that, um, and regardless of how the dust settles with uh, the various DNA studies, even if we have a, a definitive outcome from those studies, uh, that's when the work begins. You know, the DNA can only tell you so much. It can establish the identity uh, or, or the existence of a movement about the identity by comparison to other, other taxa, but it's, as far as it's behavior and natural history, its range, um, pattern of activity, those things will only be determined through field observation. And it's not right. going to suddenly become any easier to uh, contact, observe. Well, you know, with, with Wookiees... Numerous people. 
we now we got Wookiees, now we've got the Falcon. I am so excited about this Star Wars reference here. Okay, so uh, Steve Alcorn, you have a question for him from Chris Fleming. Yeah, I have a couple questions, but the first one from uh, Chris Fleming is, how close are we to seeing the Falcon project uh, come to fruition? Well, as I said, if, if this, uh, I'm meeting with the gentleman uh, personally. He's coming to the university, and we're also sitting down with our uh, college uh, development officer, uh, who's the representative from the ISU Foundation. And if if it uh, if it materializes, and if we we have a an event planned, we had one planned for the end of this month, but our sponsors asked us to push it back. They, uh, a little bit. So we're, we're looking now at uh, May uh, May 4th uh, to be uh, an event to be held in Olympia. Uh, similar to the, the program that, uh, that William Barnes put together in St. George uh, about a year or so ago when he first first publicly broached the Falcon Project concept. Um, if that, uh, if that uh, or when that comes together, uh, you know, that would be intended to be a fundraising event. Um, that combined with a couple of other initiatives that we've got and a few uh, potential corporate sponsors, I think we'll have enough to, um, uh, enough to uh, uh, provide the operating funds for this first year. We could be uh, in the air in June. So it's, uh, like I said, I think it's going to happen this, this summer. That's awesome. That's Great. We finally have some good news. I think your mm -hmm. Falcon project, your uh, field guide, and Bart Coutinho and Tyler Higgins' uh, Sierra's Evidence Initiative um, uh, thing that's going on are the good news of Bigfooting right now because it's been like a nightmare with the hoaxers and the extortionists and and this Daisy and and what else has there been? Um, I you know it's 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 a circus. And unfortunately, you have to go weeding through the circus to get to the good stuff. Yeah. And you are the That's end. Right. You are, and I'm saying this for everybody here. You are the end all, be all when it comes to bigfooting. You know, so whenever something outrageous comes out, everyone is waiting for what your response is going to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well, I appreciate that. I, I you know, and I, and I strive to try to maintain that uh, that posture so that there is some some sense of. Uh, Sanity <laughs> in the mix, and uh, and you know, uh, just a, a sober, objective voice. That uh, so hopefully I can continue to live up to that. So we have a question from J. C. Johnson. He um, wanted to know if um, do you believe, in light of the new DNA testing, that the Snellgrove Lake samples would have stood a better chance of positive identification? I guess they were gathered blood and skin samples from nail boards. Um, right. They were tested for well, the mitochondrial. There, there were two two factors involved in that, and one is is the uh, state of the uh, tissue samples themselves. I mean, when when it was explained to me the condition under which these had been left on that nail board, that screw board, uh, you know, leaned up against the cabin year round, so. Freezing cold in the winter time, in the blazing sun in the summertime, you know all the degradation from temperature and UV radiation. I said there's there's not a snowball chance that, that, that there's anything salvageable there. And but we want uh, you know the producer Doug Hijack wanted us to at least go through the motions of, of discussing what this could have meant and, and what we might have done had circumstances been more favorable. And, and that's why it was so intriguing. That's where we're preparing to do this, and I'm looking more closely now at these screws because the things right in front of me on the table, and, and I notice this, you know, this uh, obvious sort of layered appearance of the residue on these screws, suggesting a layer of adipose tissue, of fatty tissue from the sole pad, and then more bloody um, uh, muscle tissue, like uh, caught in the thread a bit higher up. And numerous strands of hair that were entangled in the in the threads of the screws. And I'm thinking, my gosh, you know, this this screw has it, and this doesn't, and this doesn't, and this doesn't. What if we connect the dots? And that's where we kind of drew the outline of what looked like the the 
the major part of a large, what would have been probably a 16, 18 inch foot that had stepped on those screws, uh, which is obviously bigger than any bear, and so it kind of uh, narrowed it down that, that uh, maybe there was the Sasquatch stepping on that. And the hair certainly seemed to bear that out. The hair was uh, in morphology and appearance, and uh, it was consistent with uh, the quote gold standard that Henry's kind of set up uh, in diameter and lack of medulla and, and um, uh, a worn uh, step where worn tip uh, and so on, parallel shaft. And <coughs> but then we, uh, you know, ran into this problem of the, of the outcome. The, the first tissue sample that was sent to Todd Nipotel was thought to possibly be blood. It had clearly degraded, though, because, I mean, to the point where, you know, I wasn't 100% sure that it was blood. It looked almost like paint. And at first blush, he was having difficulty extracting anything from it that would suggest that it was, in fact, blood. Uh, but um, then in follow-up, that's when Kurt Nelson uh, worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. Finally got it purified to the point that he could get DNA. But then, you know, when you manipulate, that's the one the one caveat there, is when you manipulate a sample, the more you work with it, the more you run it out and into a gel and try to purify it and reelude it and so on, and the more chances there are that it's going to get contaminated. And so when he did a very modest 300 base pairs, uh, there's not a lot you can say about that. It had one substitution that uh, differed from reported sequences for humans that match, but uh, was common in chimpanzee sequences. So, I mean, it's obviously not a chimpanzee, but maybe that's a small segment that is shared in common with uh, with great apes and has a variation that differs from humans. Or it's a misread, you know, or it's contaminated and it's a misread. One out of 300, you just misidentified what the nucleotide was at that position. Um, so it's that, that's why it was so equivocal. So that brings me to this next question. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. Sharon yeah. Day, she's a paranormal author and researcher, and she wanted to know, what is your stand on Sasquatch being an ape? There's so much misperception. Anymore, I'm always a little gun-shy to, to say ape versus human because people have uh, different preconceptions of what the characteristics of those two entities are. And... And, uh, and fail also to recognize that there, there's a lot of potential variation in the, in the, the space in between those two species, or, or well, those two groups. If we say, you know, if we limit it to African apes, say for a moment, chips and grills. Um, and so my point has always been that I've seen myself no evidence to suggest anything in anatomy or behavior that can't be accommodated within the, the normal range of variation or, or fairly closely accommodated uh, by the behaviors and anatomies of great apes. Even, even bipedalism. I mean, gorillas and chimps are facultatively bipedal. They can walk on two legs just fine. Uh, and in fact, you know, there are a few individuals who habitually do it, like Oliver, that got all kinds of attention, but which is simply a chimpanzee, a very odd chimpanzee in, in behavior, but he uh, he preferred to stand upright when he was around people, especially. And um, but but what is there to suggest? I mean, unless you go to the paranormal, unless you place credibility in the in the testimony of individuals, the very subjective experiences of individuals who claim to be in communication, to have these, you know. Uh, higher levels of consciousness uh, uh, experiences with, with Sasquatch, um, none, none of which can be demonstrated, none of which can be replicated. Um, if, you, if you eliminate those, then what are you left with? Well, nothing to point to. There's no, um, there's, there's really no good solid evidence yet of language. There's some tentative, suggestive notions that they're that they have some form of verbal communication. Uh, but many of them do. That doesn't make you a human. It, uh, uh, 
and there's you know there's no home bases, there's no fire use, there's no clothing, there are no consistent use of modified tools. There's you know you just go right down the list. All of those things that we associate with the genus Homo since its appearance, you know, at least two and a half million years ago, um, are absent, are altogether absent. Uh, from it. So, if it is a hominid or hominin in the preferred nomenclature today by Plaitis, then then it, it's a very early branch of bipedal hominid that uh, that preceded the emergence of, of Homo, something like I've suggested, and, and others have suggested before me, robust Australopithecine. Uh, Gordon Strasenberg was a champion of that, and it never got a lot of traction in those days because, uh, you know, the only known Australopithecines were in Africa. And so you, you had this choice, Gigantopithecus or robust Australopithecine. Well, in Gigantopithecus, you had an ape that was the right size in the right place at the right time to very, very readily expand its range through uh, a land bridge. At, at times when there was contiguous forest across the Bering Land Bridge, mm -hmm. you know, through that habitat into North America. With uh, robust Australopithecines, you had to get a smaller hominid from Africa, which was the only place we knew about, all the way through across Asia and up through the Bering Land Bridge and into into North America. Now the discovery of the Hobbit kind of put a whole different spin on that because the Hobbit is clearly either a very early Homo or late Australopithecine. You know, meaning it's been around uh, whether it was it was in Southeast Asia the whole time, but it's been around for you know, two to three million years. And so it, it to have gotten to Flores in Indonesia, it had to have expanded its range from Africa into Southeast Asia without leaving any known fossil record at the moment. So if it did that, why not a robust form like uh, Australopithecus boy guy, which uh, achieved gigantism? Dr. Meldrum, there's another um, animal that has somehow achieved gigantism. We're going to go into Steve Elkhorn's question. Here we go, Steve. Uh, Dr. Meldrum, uh, Justice Smeo wanted to know, uh, what is your take on the idea that Bigfoot could be a relative to the giant lemur, as suggested by Melba. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, who, who, where did this question originate? Justin Smeo. Uh, from Justin Smeo. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Yeah, it a, um, I, yeah, you know, I, I'm sorry to laugh. I, I hate to laugh at anything. Oh, because it's hysterical. I could not believe <laughs> um, that uh, statement that she made, that she alluded that Oh, and don't, did you know that there are, I, I just found out there are lemurs that were 400 to 500 pounds. <laughs> did that make them more attractive to a, a homo sapiens in northern Europe 15,000 years ago? She just took a little junket down to Madagascar to hook up with a giant lemur. I like to move uh, it, move was, it. Uh, I like to move uh, it, move it. It was found to be, come extinct within 5,000 years. But, oh my God. Um, in, in her published paper, there is a very odd... Uh, phylogram of some kind or another, which includes, for some reason, sequences from Autolemur, which is uh, just a, a Galago, uh, one of the Galago species, and uh, and clearly she uh, the, the sequence data is not reliable because it shows she, uh, um, her sample being. Uh, very closely allied uh, or trending, in her word, towards this auto lemur sequence, and and she tried to uh, my listen to one of her interviews uh, suggested that she tried to kind of downplay that by saying that this, this all eventually gets resolved as we learn more. Well, in other words, that's just a, a polite way of saying that her data isn't worth anything. And it's unreliable in its present form, and her and the discrepancies that that are cropping up will be worked out eventually. Well, you don't publish data that or that is that unreliable that's giving an obvious uh, contradictory result to well-established phylogenetic relationships based on lots and lots and lots of evidence. You know, so I that uh, that was. 
that was a remarkable revelation. <laughs> well, it also makes for very good entertainment. <laughs> well, that's true. Absolutely. Justin Smea's Bigfoot DNA sample was tested by two different, you know, there was the Camp Ketchum, and then there was the Trent University, and Camp Ketchum says it's Bigfoot, with mitochondrial being human, and blah, 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 and then there's Trent saying, uh, bear. Right. Okay, Judge Judy, you're on. What is it? Well, that's, I mean, this, this was the, the issue that, that reared its head very early on when, when Derek invited me down to the quote-unquote kill site, uh, the alleged kill site, because when Justin produced this little Ziploc bag that had uh, a postage stamp size, size piece of the, of the hide and hair and handed it to me, you know, I, I put a 15-power loop on it and took a look. And I looked up and looked at Justin and I said, well, this isn't primate hair. And he immediately backpedaled and said, oh, well, I never said it was Sasquatch hair. I, this is just what I dug up, you know, when he came back to the scene at the urging of Derek Randalls and, and brought his dog, his, his bear hunting dog, presumably. And wherever the dog showed interest, he dug in through the two and a half feet of snow and came up with this, this piece of, of hide. That wasn't a steak. I don't know why he's going to be, he's going to be getting characterized as a steak. There, if there was any muscle tissue, it was very limited. It was mostly just uh, skin and adipose and hair at that. Well, and then I came, I came back to the lab and put it under the scope, and there, were, there was clearly differentiation between very coarse guard hairs. That's what I mentioned. 50% wider hairs. than human hair, and Sasquatch, well, the, the, what we think is Sasquatch, and we qualify that, what we think is Sasquatch is very similar in its uh, course or its fineness. It's about 65 microns across in diameter. You know, and this was you know 90 to 100 and long, tapering guard hairs and very fine, very narrow um, under fur that was you know only about 20 microns across that had a, steer, a serial step. Uh, ladder medulla uh, and, and absolutely devoid of any pigment in the underfur. So it was just, it was white and translucent as could be. Dr. Meldrum, um, yeah. that, mm -hmm. that brings up a point, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, you oh, were talking oh. earlier about, um, you know, the, um, the altering, I guess you call it, of uh, samples from extensive testing. Do you think that that is how uh, the Ketchum study got the uh, Sasquatch results that they desired on that same sample? Um, I, I honestly have no idea how they got their results. I mean, I, you know, they, there have been all sorts of claims about the, the work done in these laboratories and so forth. I, you know, I think one of their revealing discussion was one that I, that I posted a link to on, on my Facebook page where these uh, PhD students and, and one PhD who was the principal voice of the group as they were ruminating over this whole thing, you know, he pointed out that, and clearly he had some experience and knew what he was talking about dealing with these types of samples, but he pointed out that everything, everything pointed to this just being a mishmash, you know, that when he did a blast search of GenBank using her, what data he had, and he had to re-enter all her data because he pointed out that it was provided as a PDF file instead of a uh, you know, some other type of a file that you could read the data directly from. He had to he had to literally re-enter it. But anyway, in doing the blast, you know, it came up with all kinds of things, including panda bear. You know, and people wonder what, how in the world would there be panda bear? Well, he he he, he very astutely pointed out that panda bear is the only bear representative for which the entire genome has been sequenced and submitted. There have been a few isolated studies of 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 uh, particular loci, particular genes in, from the bear genome that have been sequenced and have been have been uploaded, but uh, but the blast then show found similarities between parts of her sample, of her sequence rather, and uh, panda, and and that that just means that there was bear in there, and that the, the bear showed similarities to panda, uh, which is closely related. So um, you know that. 
I'm quite confident that was almost certainly Justin's sample. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, you know, these stories that there have been different samples that Justin sent something to something to Melba and something to, to me and something to Tyler and and Bart. I, you know, I can't I can't comment on. I, I have no way of knowing one way or the other. Uh, but the point is that uh, if if everything is above board and if the sample that Justin recovered is in fact uh, from, from Melba's, uh, Melba's description, it sounds like it's one of the three genomic sequences, or it was used in producing one of the three genomic sequences. The fact that it was quote unquote consistent with all the others, and that's an interesting point too. I mean, she cites what, 109 samples that she received and all of them were consistent. I mean, when I, when I asked for hair samples uh, to be sent to Brian Sykes for his project, you know, I, I got a lot of people sent them directly to him, but I got maybe nine samples, and of those, immediately, I think it was five of the nine were eliminated as just other common wildlife. So, and that's my experience, that when people pick up a sample in the field, the chances of it being a Sasquatch, even if there was a, a credible encounter or a footprint find or some some circumstantial evidence or circumstances to suggest that Sasquatch is in the city, the chances of being a Sasquatch hair sample are pretty slim. I mean, there's hair all over in the environment out there. It's, it's ubiquitous. Um, you know, I, I like to point out there's a, a book um, on tracking this one by Resendence, and he, or no, no, I'm sorry, maybe it's El Um He makes the point that he would challenge his students when they had taken a break for lunch, sat down. Before they could get up, they had to find 10 strands of hair. And, you know, that seems like a ridiculous, uh, ridiculously impossible uh, uh, challenge, but he said, once you get a search image for the hair, he said, it's all over the place. It, it, it persists in the environment for a long time. That hair might not be very good for DNA analysis, and that can cause a problem. Strands of hair are picked up, and then the DNA is uh, integrated through exposure to the sun and elements and so forth. So back to the, the, the point at hand, it was just simply the fact that she claimed that uh, she, she gave no disclaimer about discounting a significant fraction of the samples that were submitted to it. That in itself is remarkably suspicious. I just find that hard to believe that, that every toenail, every scrap of bone, every bit of hair, every bit of blood that she received turned out to be Sasquatch. So I tell you that the Bigfoot community has gotten very efficient in collecting forensic evidence. Then. Okay, well I have a, an additional question kind of um that trails off of that. Um, this question is from David Batdorf, and um, it kind of goes hand in hand with the Ketchum study and the claims being made by David Politis at his lectures, where he's speaking all over the country. Um, of all the weirder things that people claim to experience, like eye shine, eye glow, bioluminescence, mind speak, infrasound, zapping, cloaking, etc. Which, if any, do you think has a sound basis in science, and why? Well, gee, of those you've, you've enumerated, I, I have to say that the one that jumped out was, was the potential for infrasound. I, I still think that's a really uh, plausible um, uh, uh, behavior for a large age. Uh, this is an area of study, and again, it's on, on my kind of bucket list of things to, to address because, uh, and I touch on it in my book, because there's only very limited um, literature, uh, limited research that's been conducted, and that is the presence of these extra laryngeal air sacs in, in the grade eight. <clears throat> and they're quite extensive. I mean, you go back to the classic anatomical literature of the apes in, in, uh, in anthropological journals and whatnot. There, uh, there have been some, some studies to look at the extent of these, and, and they're quite extensive in, in gibbons and siamons uh, and orangutans. They're um, present in, to a lesser degree in gorillas and, and only rarely in chimpanzees. And uh, in humans, they are almost never present, but they are 
anomalously every every now and again. Uh, and then if you watched uh, what was that movie? You know, I just went blank. Um, oh, shucks. The uh, one with uh, Hurt. Um, <laughs> he comes out of his uh, of his isolation tank, having externalized his experience as a as a, a, a hominid. Hmm. And uh, can't talk, and he has uh, they they X-ray his neck, and he has uh, laryngeal air sac, and that was that was one of my first exposures to this whole concept that the primates have these extra extra air sacs. But um, if Sasquatch is a close relative of the apes uh, and and or humans, then it would conceivably have such. Uh, extra laryngeal air sac. Now, and the degree of development would vary depending on um, the, the uh, position within the phylogeny and, and its adaptations and selection for the use of those air sacs. Now, the air sacs can can serve as, as resonating chambers. It can be used in um, they they can be used in uh, producing loud calls by sustaining the the air volume, and the exhalation, if they're infralaryngeal, then the, all the air in those sacs, as it's expelled, will pass across the, the uh, vocal tract to the vocal cords. So do you think, doctor, that with yeah. these um, infrasound capabilities, combined with a person's anxiety and panic attack, it just adds to their fear, their paralyzing right. fear? That's, that's exactly right. You know, I often, I often wondered, when you would talk to these individuals, and some were, you know, were experienced outdoorsmen. They were experienced hunters. You know, they, they quote, weren't afraid of the dark type of guys and, and women. And uh, yet they would describe this otherwise inexplicable fear, this visceral response to their experience. And they, they, you know, they swear they'll never go back there again, or they never go in the woods without a firearm there. You know, I'm wondering what the, what could they have experienced that would have such a traumatizing effect, and and you know, it, the the uh, the uh, physiological and psychological effects of exposure to infrasound um, could explain that. Now, you know, the 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 the, uh, the less plausible aspects of it is that that usually um, it requires very high decibels of uh, of, of that vocalization to have those kinds of effects, and so the question is, you know, could they be exposed to that that intense of a of a blast? And you know, there there certainly are examples of, of animals, predators, that like tigers that, that use a blast of infrasound to partially incapacitate or stun their prey as they're, as they're making their leap, um, their their final approach on on the prey item. So that's you know, it's certainly possible. Definitely is possible. We've got uh, like a hundred questions to ask you from a lot of our uh, friends and Team Taser members. Uh, one is from uh, Bobby Keane. Uh, she uh, says that, uh, where'd she go? There she is. She says hello and wants to know where do you stand in Bigfooting as an expert or a scientist that wants to know more? Where do you place yourself in this field? Well, I certainly wouldn't give myself the label of, of expert. I don't. I know. Well, we give you. Expert. We give you that label. <laughs> well, I, well, you know, but the subject that has a lot of unanswered questions, and so, so certainly, I want to know more. I mean, I, I do. I, I mean, and, and partly for that reason, I've always kind of remained aloof from the various organizations. It's not that I'm antisocial. It's just that I don't want. I don't want my, my posture and position and and reputation to be used by other groups you know to lend credibility to their efforts when i'm not even directly involved with them and so i i i'm always make myself available as a resource to those such groups to individuals and um uh but i you know i i my feet are squarely in the scientific community and addressing this uh, as a question of, of uh, anthropology and, and primatology, um, and uh, and as I said, it it dovetails so elegantly with my 
uh, pre-existing research program, which was uh, you know primate functional morphology in the broadest sense, and, and uh, the evolution of polypipetism specifically. I mean, here here's the possibility of the existence of another biped, which could have very well evolved bipedalism completely independently. But even if it hasn't, I mean, we're, we're beginning to recognize as anthropologists that, that bipedalism was not just a one-size-fits-all, that uh, the adaptations of various uh, and diverse hominids may have employed uh, you know, different strategies and different morphologies to, to accomplish their specific uh, their specific uh, objectives and adaptation. So, um, you know, it, either way, it's a fascinating independent example of bipedalism against which to compare and contrast the human condition. And, you know, how, how could I, in good conscience, walk away from, from such a thing, let alone the mystique of, of the possible existence of an unrecognized primate in our own backyard? So I have a question from Bill Brock. He's the host of the Rogue Bigfoot Show. And this is a question that you, of all people, are going to have to give the best answer for. The question is, do you think the mid-tarsal break gives Sasquatch extreme sprinting capability? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. I mean, <clears throat> it, it's not an adaptation designed for sprinting. I mean, the human humans are sprinters. You know, there was a documentary where they, they pitted a, a human against a racehorse uh, in a 50-yard dash, and the human won because we are designed for that. I mean, our, our long legs, our stable uh, foot that provides a, a, a platform and lever with a, with a speed uh, ratio of our heel to, to uh, forefoot, um, those are all things that are, are for uh, for, for sprinting, as well as endurance running. I mean, physiologically, we're adapted to, to endurance running and walking. But the Sasquatch, I mean, the, the, the um, mid-tarsal break, as it's manifested in a terrestrial biped, would, should be best seen as an adaptation for negotiating very steep, broken environments, where that flexibility allows for the prehensile function of the forefoot, in spite of the loss of the divergent big toe, or the loss of divergence of the big toe, I should say. The toe's still there, just the divergence is lost. Uh, but then the heel can then still act independently while the forefoot uh, provides a, a basis of support and prehension. Um, you know, all, all apes are capable of bursts of speed. I mean, if you've ever seen uh, chimpanzees displaying or or uh, fighting uh, or chasing one another at the zoo, they can they can locate uh, very rapidly over short distances, but they're they're not going to uh, run a marathon. They don't have the capacity to do something like that. Um, uh, chimps also, um, you know, they especially those that are actively patrolling their their home range uh, will often cover um, a certain amount of distance, you know, not, not a huge amount, a mile or two a kilometer, a few kilometers, as they patrol the perimeter of their, of their range, but they're not uh, long distance walkers. So, I don't know if that, if that answers. Yeah, it does, you know, because so many, the terrain. I get so many people who who think that the mid-tarsal break, and I guess in this instance the term break is an unfortunate one, because it's viewed as a, as a disabling feature, one that, 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 uh, that makes the, the foot less functional and uh, debilitating. I've had this argument with several um, you know, uninformed podiatrists, for example, who poo-poo who, who, who it because they say you know, they couldn't walk. And they, they immediately point to humans, humans with fallen arches and, you know, a Lisfranc fracture of the foot are, are debilitated. Well, we're not talking about a dysfunction. We're not talking about a pathology. You know, we're not talking about a broken foot. We're talking about the normal anatomy and function of a non-human primate foot. 
and it, it's very different. And, and the failure of those individuals to be able to recognize that distinction just, you know, it makes the discussion pointless, quite honestly. But also recognizing the, the distinctions of a, a non human foot morphology. Tammy, go for it. Dr. Meldrum. Yes. Uh, the Bigfoot chick, Melissa Adair, asked, do you have a favorite Bigfoot report or story? <laughs> oh, gee. Um, you know, the one that always pops into mind when, when I'm asked something like that or I'm asked to give an example of, of you know, a credible sighting is, is Julie Davidson's experience. Um, Julie Davidson in, in uh, Colorado. She's an avid packer and uh, often uses goats. And she, on this trip, she had a few goats and a couple dogs with her. She was off trail, uh, off, just off of the Continental Divide Trail in southern Colorado and uh, had made camp. And anyway, to make a long story short, she came up face to face in mid afternoon with a Sasquatch. She came out of her tent uh, concerned that she might be being stalked by a bear uh, because of the behavior of her dogs. And when she came out with pepper spray, standing right behind her tent was this eight foot tall Sasquatch. And they locked eyes and uh, sized one another up. And uh, she said she had this uh, sort of a subliminal impression that uh, from it that it, if you don't hurt me, I won't hurt you or bother you, you know. At which point it's facial expression relaxed and then at that point uh, a second one, a, a smaller one was standing immediately behind it peering around at her from, from the side. So there are actually two of them. But I mean here she is she, Julie has walked the entire Continental Divide Trail alone well with the exception of, of the company of goats and dogs. She's an avid naturalist very well informed of, of the flora and fauna and and a great observer, <laughs> and uh, you know when you sit across the the room or across the campfire, as, as it happened to be, and hear her recount the details and her impressions of what she saw and experienced. I mean, how do you how do you say to someone like that? Well, you just imagined it, or or you mistook something else for it, you know. I mean, she saw it or she didn't, and I and I believe that she saw what she says she saw, and 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 that can be repeated. I mean, there was one a recent one here closer to home in Idaho that I discovered uh, when the uh, Montpelier Museum put on an exhibit. And I helped them put it together and spoke there at the museum. And several people came forward. And one was was one of the doses, and he was the retired police chief, had been on a hunting trip. Uh, to the east of uh, Montpelier there up in the mountains and came around a bend in the trail and right there on the trail was a Sasquatch. Again, mid-afternoon, broad daylight. And he was just very matter-of-fact in his description of it. You know, he had his rifle swung over his shoulder. He never had a, the, the urge or the inclination to, to unshoulder his rifle, but uh, it was a, a very close and vivid encounter. You know, and so long as those kinds of experiences, those kinds of people exist, I mean, how can you just simply say, oh, this is just imagination? Unfortunately, those get swamped <laughs> sometimes by the plethora of log squatches and, and uh, uh, tree structures and, and tree knocks and, uh, and, you know, unidentified vocalizations and, and all this indirect evidence that... Uh, you know, that you always have to take with a grain of salt. Uh, I mean, w whenever we're dealing with eyewitnesses, you're you're at the mercy of the of the knowledge base of that individual, um, of their powers of observation, ability to interpret their experience, let alone their credibility. Um, so even the most genuine and sincere witness can be absolutely wrong about what they experience. And so that's why I'm always pushing for, you know, did, did you, was, was there any corroborative evidence? Was there, was there footprints? Was there hair? Was there anything with scat pile? Something that can be evaluated in a more objective way um, and not rely just solely on anecdotes. Thank you. 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 Thank you
the stories that people tell where they're looking into uh, Sasquatch's eyes are definitely by far my favorite. Also, I think Steve Alcorn has a question for you, Dr. Meldrum. Okay. Yes, I do. Um, Christopher York wanted to know, of the evidence that's available uh, now, what is the most compelling that points to the existence of Sasquatch, and what would you like to see in the future? For well, evidence? yeah. Well, obviously. Uh, well, for, from my perspective, at this point, and, and particularly because it's most significant to me because of, because of my expertise in this area, my ability, I think, to appreciate what it is I'm seeing, that, that's the, the, the sum total of the footprint evidence. I mean, that's why this trip that I recently made to uh, Massachusetts General Hospital was, was very gratifying because it was one of the rare times I could speak to a a fairly large audience of people who could appreciate the technical interpretations and observations that, that I've made and, uh, regarding uh, the Sasquatch foot. Um, and uh, and that, that, was, that was really amazing experience and to see them, you know, see them acknowledge and see them recognize and see them become more and more impressed by that body of evidence. Obviously, short Excuse me, short of a body, it, it will be the DNA evidence that tips the scale, however. Yeah, um, and unfortunately because of the whole Ketchum Circus, yeah. now more than ever do we need a body. Well, exactly, exactly. I'm still holding out some hope that, uh, that the, the Sykes Project isn't a wash. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that amongst them, the samples that he has received, something will be representative of, the, of those samples that we have had some confidence in based on the morphology. Um, you know, his efforts are being spread three different ways, and so I, I'm just hoping that he uh, follows through and certainly has some, some good results, and, and that will hopefully rise above, above the flux from and jet. <laughs> so, <laughs> his money is uh, besmirching the waters at the present, but we'll see. So, you, of all the times that you've been out in the woods, you have not experienced anything yet have you oh, oh yes well, I've had experiences I had not seen one but I've had experience I mean, I've, I've had rocks thrown at me in places where there was no one else around to throw a rock I mean I'm quite confident of that uh, the rock throwing experience up at the Snowgirl Lake that, that was featured on the Monster Quest episode and oh at that cabin experience. yes I remember at the cabin that's right uh, and a similar experience uh, with a much larger rock was uh, had in the Siskiyous, uh, one of the first expeditions I was participant in uh, down in the Six Rivers National Forest. Um, that was a softball-sized rock that landed just feet away from me. And I mean, it wasn't intended to harm. I think it was just intended to get our attention and to encourage us to move along. I think we were not welcome where we were at, but. Um, I've had um, I've had things just outside my tent, you know, but, but under conditions of fog and complete, you know, total darkness at night, that uh, flashlights were almost use, useless. Um, but foot, footfalls and corroborated with footprints and you know, indistinct footprints, but nevertheless, 16-inch oval footprints in the grass and, and in the in along the um, effluent from the spring that were filled back in with water. Um, you know, there have been, you know, one which brushed against the tent at one time and rifled through backpacks. And so I've had things like that. Uh, I've heard one, one or two vocalizations. I've found footprints on half a dozen occasions. And oh, that reminds me, i got to ask you, thank you for bringing that up. Um, if in the event when I go squatching, which I shall be uh, going squatching for my very first time soon, can I add, now remember where this is coming from, can I add pink food coloring in the water when making the plaster um, goopy stuff? Can I create a pink Bigfoot cast? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Yeah, you can add, in fact, uh, you know, sometimes I use um, mortar pigment. Uh, powdered pigment you can add to the plaster to give it a, a gray, sort of a photo gray color. You know, those those blazing white casts are very difficult to to look at and, and even more difficult to photograph. 
uh, and if you can render it down into a, an off-white or a gray, a photo gray, then you can cast shadows on it and photograph it much better. Or what I do after the fact is that, that gives it a very even tone. But I, uh, you know, if you've seen the replicas that I right. uh, make available for sale, they're uh, colored with a, a slurry of mortar pigment after the fact when the plaster is still wet and, and uh, or still green, not wet, but still green. And, um, uh, you know, I paint them with that and then kind of rub it on and bring out some highlights. And it just makes, it just makes the, the, the topography, the contours jump out a little more visibly um, and, and a little more aesthetically. If I'm lucky and I get a Bigfoot cast and if it's pink, I'd be like the gay Bigfoot. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, one of our friends, Lupe Mendoza, um, who has seen a Bigfoot up in Mount Rainier, close enough to where you've seen the wrinkles on its forehead, um, yeah. you want to know what your feelings were towards this Igor dude, that Russian guy, and the Russian DNA research on the Yeti. You know, does do you trust it, um, especially about the hoax that they recently put out for tourism? I mean, is that like part of the circus? Is this like a an addendum to the Circus Act? What is it? Yeah. Well, I don't... Uh... Uh, now there, there is. Um, if we're talking about the same thing, uh, are we talking about the DNA or the work that was done on the hair, as opposed to the I anything that has been done in collaboration with Mel McKetchum? I think he's talking to all of the above. Okay. Well, I know there was there was some disinformation. Unfortunately, there was a, a gentleman. Now he's uh, caught me flat-footed here, and his name has escaped me, but he. He got some notoriety, and it was the impression was given that DNA analysis was conducted on the hair samples collected at the uh, Escaya's cave there uh, that we visited at the time that we visited, and uh, and I I tried to follow up with that, and and he assured me that was not the case, that the DNA analysis was done on uh, on the hair samples that were collected several years earlier. And I can't even honestly can't even remember. I don't think there was any conclusive results because, or I would have remembered them. Um, I have a tendency to forget stuff that's just fluff and uh, and just let it go out the other ear. Um, my, you know, I, I, I still I still hope that I'm friends, considered to be a, a friend of, of Igor Borchev. I hate to be on any bad terms with anyone. Um, it was a disappointing trip, I have to admit because there was such blatant exploitation of the situation. You know, and I don't begrudge them um, utilizing the public interest in the subject to, uh, you know, for economic development. But you need to make sure that the science remains pristine. I mean, it remains uh, un unadulterated. You, you must have been really disappointed because you traveled far for that. On, on their on their time, still you could have been like in Hawaii. You could have been like here with us. You know, I mean. Well, <laughs> well yeah. Well, I didn't. I would. Uh, I, I, I very much appreciated the opportunity to see their country. And to, I mean, they rolled out the red carpet for it. We had dinner with one of the senators. You know, the uh, I'm not sure exactly the equivalency of the offices, but one of the mafia, of the federal uh, <laughs> officers, and at this uh, very interesting uh, restaurant that was uh, quite uh, traditional uh, with, with traditional dishes, uh, like a hunting lodge. Hmm. Uh, we had, uh, I mean, they flew us then. Well, we, we were at the Moscow Darwin Museum and, and gave brief presentations there for the press. You know, the press was swarming all over us. I was very disappointed that there was no other one no other uh, people or groups in attendance. The scientific community had zero representation. Uh, of course, unfortunately, the scheduling didn't put us in, in conflict with a major conference. So many of the anthropologists were tied up in uh, in a prior commitments to this conference uh, that, they, that they attended. But anyway, um, you know, we we were treated uh, as like VIPs throughout. The, the time, and, and that put me in a very awkward position when then when we went to the cave, and there was clearly, uh, you know, untoward behaviors uh, taking place, and I was mm -hmm. having none of it, and and then, of course, the interviews with the press, 
thankfully I had a very sympathetic reporter from Russia today and she tried not to put me on the spot too much. But uh, but it was it was very awkward, you know, that my my lack of enthusiasm was duly noted at the dinner table that evening and during the toasts and all and you, it, you uh, must have been heartbroken. Well, it just, I mean, uh, it, 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 it was disappointing, too, because Igor, unfortunately, had completely abandoned any ambition to further involve the scientific community beyond those few individuals who were already enthusiastic and had been involved for some time. He basically, uh, instead, was resorting to the government to legislate the recognition of such a population and its protection and study. And that was the idea that the Institute would be developed in order to um, promote interest in the subject. But it was interest with the express and aim of, uh, <laughs> of uh, developing and of promoting tourism in the region uh, as a winter resort. Well, winter and summer resort, but, but especially winter with skiing and snowmobiling and, and so on being the, the, um, the aim. And so that was unfortunate. I mean, we sat down, you know, they, they had, uh, Igor wrote out uh, a declaration based on the supposed discoveries of our quote-unquote expedition, which was nothing more than a field trip, um, to the cave and to the, up, up onto the mountaintop where we had a, bird's eye view of the surrounding terrain. It was wonderful. It was a really great, uh, great experience. But, uh, and, and as a result of that, you know, wanted to declare that we, this is where the 99% certain phrase that was in the press came into play and wanted us all to sign it mm. and was, uh, was dismayed when I refused. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know, this is not the way it's done. Uh, I mean, maybe the way it's done here, but I'm, I'm not signing any declaration. I said, none of that has been vetted. It's, uh, those footprints were not compelling. The hair was um, questionable. The nest was was laughable. And, uh, you know, the, the coincidence of all this, I mean, it was really telling. I mean, for example, just as we're as we're we're piking out to the site, you know, I, I noticed there were lots there was lots of pruning that had taken place and trees and shrubs along the way. And I and I asked the district magistrate, you know, who maintains this trail? He looked at me and said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Who who maintains this trail? Keeps it clear of brush." He says, "Oh no, this is all wild. This is completely natural." I said, "Well, look, there's saw cuts right here." <laughs> Someone's out here cutting the thing, you know, cutting the branches and cutting the deadfall, and and uh, you would have none of them. So you know, it was that kind of of, of uh, attitude. But immediately, then you know, set, set the red flags up, and then we got to the cave, and it became all too obvious. See, that's a, that's like one of the first times we heard you call people out on their excuse my language bullshit. I mean, there's so much of it out there, and you spoke out, and you're like, um, no. <laughs> that was awesome. Well, yeah, Instead of being like, you know, I, I persona non grata now, and I and I don't expect to become be invited back by that group, but I don't see any uh, value in returning in that capacity. I I'm much more excited. I mean, there's the, I have uh, good prospects to return to Russia this summer to uh, work in collaboration with uh, Dmitry Pirkulov, not Dmitry Bayanov, but Dmitry Pirkulov, who's a filmmaker in Moscow, a young investigator who's very interested in this subject and uh, very uh, very intelligent very uh, grounded and uh, very well connected with some of the old guard like Mary Jean Kaufman and uh, what was most exciting uh, and he discussed this at the, at the uh, at least the event at Moscow he didn't accompany us down to uh, Kimarola but uh, he uh, has been doing work for several years in the Caucasus and uh, recovered a footprint cast that was made by villagers of a um, you know, full 16, 16, 17 inch footprint that is in every way, shape and form Sasquatch-like and uh, I'm hoping this summer we'll, we're going to go back and follow up with some interviews and there supposedly is another cast and some photo snapshots of some of the footprints in the snow 
uh, and then do some field work in that region. So that would be an interesting trip. I, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to work with with Mr. Brickwell. Dr. Meldrum? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt again, but I have another question from a big fan of yours. Uh, hey. Melissa, Melissa Millspa, she's a fan, and asked, is studying Bigfoot cash your primary field? I have wondered, could the story I heard be true of a Bigfoot rescuing a hiker in trouble? They are so much like us. Is it possible they would have this type of compassion on a human? Is that a legitimate question? Sure, it's a legitimate question. I, the, the first part is, that, that is where I feel that I was able to, and, and they're uh, able to make a significant contribution and therefore focus my energies and attention was, was on the footprints to carry forward you know, some of the work that Dr. Kranz had started. Um, uh, and, and while he was a very accomplished anatomist and anthropologist, he was not an expert in foot function and, and evolutionary history uh, of the of bipedalism. Um, so that, yes, I think that's you know, one of the things that, that, that I do, uh, you know, claim some expertise in. As far as the expression of compassion, I mean, you can go to YouTube or wherever, and there's been some great examples of, uh, remember the boy in London who fell over the fence into the moat, and the female gorilla scooped him out and cuddled him yeah. and cradled him, and he was unconscious at first, and, and kept the others at bay, and then brought him over to the door where the keepers accessed the, the enclosure so that they could retrieve him. I mean, it was the most, uh, you know, compassionate <laughs> expression of compassion. That, that, again, you don't have to resort to humanity to find examples of these um, human-like emotions. Uh, I mean, you don't have to exclude uh, apes and other animals. I mean, uh, what, what do you call the dog who wakes up the, his owner when the house is on fire? I mean, it's, there, there's all kinds of... Uh, examples of the various levels of, of cognition and, and emotional attachment and and or empathy that uh, <clears throat> that, that is, is uh, present. I mean, if, if studies of great apes showing that they have a sense of self, you know, they, they pass the mirror test. They recognize themselves in a mirror rather than reach behind, you know, as Harry the Hendersons did. We watched that the other night. This for the heck of it, and uh, I, I've forgotten about that part. Uh, Harry would have certainly known that that reflection in the mirror was him and not something behind that pane of glass. And, and that is integral to uh, expressions of empathy. When you understand that there's a difference between you and, and someone else, you're able to um, you're able to put yourself in someone else's position, basically see the world from their point of view, and, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that doesn't, doesn't make them more human than, than ape-like. I, I, hate, I hate, hate to be a curmudgeon, but I just looked at the time. I'm five minutes late for my class. Uh-oh. Um, so, the two o'clock was our deadline. We got kind of a, uh, a little bit of a later start. All right, so let's say uh, goodbye. Uh, Cliff yeah. Barackman sent me a text message right now saying he sends you his best. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so, thank, thank you, you so much. Them. We would love to have you back. This has been a great conversation. Okay, well, it, it would be fun. I had a good time. All right. Now go teach. Go teach. Approved!